we have we are very very fortunate because today on the holiday of Purim we have somebody who does understand both ancient Persia and modern Iran. Um, Harold Rood is probably one of the few experts alive in the West who really can understand the Persian mindset um, as well as the mentality of the entire Middle East. Harold has spent more than 28 years in office um, as, as a, under the U.S. Secretary of Defense as an advisor on Islamic affairs. After earning his Ph.D. at Columbia University in Islamic history under the esteemed, wonderful Bernard Lewis, who should live and be well, Harold studied and traveled extensively throughout the Islamic world. He studied in Mashhad, Iran, during the early and middle stages of the 1979 Islamic Revolution and saw firsthand how the Iranian people could turn on a dime to back, quote, the strongest bully in the playground. Dr. Rode served with the United States Armed Forces in Iraq, both during the recent war in Iraq and during the Gulf War. Um, Harold is also famous for being the person who was responsible for finding and rescuing sacred Jewish manuscripts from Iraq during the recent Iraqi war. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Harold Rode. Well, well Sarah, first of all, I'd like to meet the guy you just described. So, uh, that's true. Thank it you very true. much. <laughs> no, I look, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, the truth is I know how little I know. And um, uh, the, the sad thing uh, about uh, when I worked uh, in the Iranian, excuse me, in the Iranian, in the, in the U.S. government, um, and I left five years ago at the grand old age of 60 then. I was the youngest person in the government who had any experience in Iran, who lived there. I don't mean as a diplomat. I mean as a student who lived in the country and experienced life there. And the sad thing, why that is therefore so important as the people who are doing negotiations right now with uh, Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, um, know nothing. Basically, they have no experience in Iran. They don't understand the culture, the language. And um, I, on the other hand, Zarif, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, was educated in Southern California. He knows American culture like the back of his hand, and he knows how to get what he wants done. And... Um, Iran, Iranian culture is probably one of the nicest and most polite cultures on the face of the earth, at least among those that I've dealt with. And they're kind and decent and sweet and very often deadly people, all at the same time. And um, uh, Kerry, as far as I'm concerned, Secretary of State Kerry and his team, uh, as best as I can determine, are way, way out of their element. And um, see, in the Middle East, two important things matter. Time, whoever has more time, when you bargain, gets a better price. Um, and America is impatient. It needs things now. Um, we, uh, 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 President Obama wants an agreement now, which means he's at a disadvantage. Imagine you're going into a store to, in, you, in the Middle East and you want to you, know, you see something you like, and you only have five minutes in the store, and the owner of the store knows that, and so he can charge a higher price, and he's just trying to see how much you want it. Now, if you have time and you're not sure and you want to come back and maybe and this and all that, the price goes down. Now, um, the other thing is that we have in in negotiations – we have this getting PS, and everybody is nice to each other, and um, we believe in the concept of goodwill. In the Middle East, there is no concept of goodwill, not in, the, in either Arabic, Turkish, or Persian. These are understood. If I give you something uh, to be nice, then I'm weak. What it means then is the other side pushes for more. And if you look, this is exactly the way the negotiations have gone between the American administration and the Iranians from the beginning. I don't know the exact numbers, but in the beginning, 
it was going to be no ability to make nuclear weapons. Now we're talking about how many years it's going to take that they could be a um, uh, uh, that they could be a breakout power, and they could how many months, how many whatever. Um, it would take for them to, to produce nuclear weapons in five years, in ten years. It won't be on Obama's watch, so that, I guess, is okay. Now, um, uh, let me just go on a, a little bit about the leadership also of Iran. The ruler of Iran, uh, the title he has, it's just, we call him in English the supreme leader. In Persian, in the language of Iran, some people call it Farsi, the word is Rahbar. And I've been for years trying to figure out what is a good translation which would give in the mind in the in the Western mindset how would we could explain what that means. And I finally it dawned on me. There's only one Western language that I know that has a similar concept, a similar word. And you'll recognize this word right away. It's Fuhrer. Meaning the Fuhrer, Hitler. Now uh that's the that's what Rahbar means. That's what, that's what Hitler was, and that's what Khomeini is right now. Now, Hitler wrote and said before, and before he got into power, exactly what he wanted to do with the Jews. Now, the Jews have experienced throughout history that usually after you threaten to kill us, eventually that's what happens. Now, the um, the nice. Um, uh, State Department establishment and all the oh he doesn't when when the Iranians say they want to eliminate the state of Israel oh he really doesn't mean it he means this he means that very nice none of these people understand Persian culture or Iran that is my experience and my response is how do you know now I'll tell you I've done some work in in China and I spent the whole day with the former. Chinese ambassador to Iran who had been there for a total of 12 years and understood the understood Iran extremely well. And he said, you know, when Khomeini and, um, uh, uh, and Ahmadinejad before, and whatever all the Iranian leaders say that they want to eliminate Israel, well, they don't really need it. It's only for domestic consumption. My response was quite simple. I said, you know, we Jews have a terrible history. We know historically that when someone threatens to eliminate us, they, when they get the opportunity, they, they try to do just that. And so it may be that Khomeini and all, all these people are doing this for domestic consumption. But we Jews can't take that risk. We, these are not for us empty words because the empty words have in the past shown to be very, very the prescient and they they do it they carry, try to carry out what they promise uh, um my question is that many people understand and appreciate that the sunni arab nations are just as scared if not more than uh israel uh, uh over the iranian shiite bomb bombs i should say um and um people have been suggesting that there can emerge a new kind of alliance between israel and the Sunni Arab and you know the Gulf Arab states, um, Harold. In your esteem, do you think this can be an enduring kind of alliance? This is this is an excellent question. What the what Israel has at the moment is a tactical alliance with the Sunni Arab powers, because the Iranian nuclear threat is so dangerous for them that they need a strong ally. They know that they unfortunately can no longer rely on the United States of America because America gets bored and runs, or a few people get killed, and we run. The Israelis are there to stay. Now, uh, in the present situation, the uh, most of the Gulf rulers in Saudi Arabia, uh, in Jordan, um, Egypt, we all have the same uh, goals here, and that is to make sure that Iran does not get a nuclear bomb. So for that, for that we have a, an alliance. But the question is, can it be enduring? Here's the problem. We have a history on this already. 
When back in 1990, when Saddam uh, of Iraq invaded Kuwait, all of a sudden, the uh, uh, Kuwaitis and the Saudis and all sorts of Gulf Arabs were buddy buddy with the Jews. I don't know so much about Israel, but in the United States, they became very, very close with a lot of the Jewish leadership and, and organizations. And frankly, the way the Jews reacted was um, a bit sad because they were, oh my God, an Arab's talking to me. Oh, I'm so happy. And uh, I know that doesn't sound nice, but that is in fact what happened. Now, um, the Saudis and the Kuwaitis, again, Sunni powers, were, I mean, they answered phone calls. They were all working together because they had a common mission to get Saddam out of Kuwait. Now, it's interesting that when America and its allies, allies went in and liberated Kuwait, that is when the um, uh, phone calls stopped. All of a sudden, the heads of Jewish organizations, uh, the phone calls were no longer asked, uh, answered. The um, Kuwaitis and the Saudis no longer uh, would call them. The, the Jews had thought that they had made some friends. In reality, it was a tactical alliance to solve a particular problem, and that problem was the um, uh, to, co- to solve the Kuwait problem, uh, to liber- help liberate Kuwait. Here's the problem now. If all of a sudden uh, the Iranian nuclear problem is taken care of, and frankly, it's not the nuclear problem. It is regime change, which is necessary in Iran. Once that is gone, then the incentives for the Arab Sunnis to work with the Israelis are over. Now, Sunni Islam, basically, whether you're an extremist or a moderate, whatever, Sunni Islam believes that it has the right to rule. Everybody else should know their place. When the Sunnis, for example, in Iraq, um, they, you know, they were the majority, but they were always ruled by, um, by Sunnis. The Shiites, excuse me, were the majority. And they were always ruled by the Sunnis. And I can only again talk to you from my own personal experience, having talked with a whole series of Shiite religious leaders, both Iraqi and Iranian. What are they petrified of in the long run? First of all, most, and I've got to be clear about this, most hate the Iranian regime because they believe that the Iranian regime is destroying Islam, Shiite Islam. So it's not a question exactly a a regime of the mullahs. The mullahs, there are mullahs that are at the top, but many mullahs in Iran and definitely in Iraq hate the Iranian government for the reasons I said, because it is destroying Shiite Islam. Islam. Now, what they are petrified of, the the Shiites, especially in Iraq and to also a, a good extent in Iran, have always needed an outside protector. What does this mean? They are about 12, 13 percent of the whole Muslim world. About 86 percent is Sunni. And they have constantly, their whole narrative is one of oppression, being oppressed by the Sunnis. That is the Shiite narrative. Now, when America came in and liberated Iraq, the Shiites saw America as a liberator, as the big brother who would protect them. But the problem then seemed that America, for whatever reason, from their point of view, got bored, ran away, and left them alone now, swimming in a Sunni sea and somewhat defenseless. Iran is, with the N, I mean, Iran is the strongest Shiite power. It's the only uh, government which is basically totally Shiite in the Muslim world. And yes, they could look to Iran, but Iran really can't stand up to all of the um, governments that is in to Lebanon and all of the uh, governments in the Persian Gulf, where there are large quantities of Shiites, so they're unprotected. Now the question is, who would protect them? Who could protect them? 
And who has, let's say, an existential um, similarity uh, with the Shiites? And, and for an odd answer, it is Israel. Here's why. Israel ain't gone nowhere. Israel is a strong power. It's the strongest power in the Middle East. And it, too, swims in a Sunni sea. It has, therefore, the same existential problem that the Shiites in Iraq and the Shiites in Iran have. This is not – so if there were a different regime in Iran, it is one that is prepared to get along with the outside world and one which would be concerned with its, with its domestic situation and not with trying to – um, bring its revolution to the world, and now it controls four countries, basically, Iran, Iraq, Yemen, and Lebanon. If uh, uh, there was a different government in Iran who wanted to get along with the United States, then uh, amazing things could happen. There would be a natural alliance, just like there was in the time of Cyrus, from the book of Isaiah in the Bible, who when he conquered Babylonia, he allowed the Jews to return and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Um, so the question, and maybe I've, I took a bit of time to answer it, Sarah, is that yes, there is a tactical alliance between the Sunni powers, but in the long run, from their point of view, Israel is... Uh, doesn't belong in the Middle East. Um, any in, in Islam, any tor- territory which was ever conquered by Islam remains Muslim in perpetuity. Now, it's going to sound a bit far afield, but it really does explain things. Mm-hmm. Spain was ruled by Islam from 712 to 1492. 1492 was 523 years ago. There are organizations, Muslim organizations, in Spain now, the goal of which is to reconquer Spain for Islam. The Spanish government is aware of it. They have all sorts of nice names, like this one which is the, there to preserve the Islamic heritage and culture of Cordoba, which was a beautiful uh, capital uh, of Islamic Spain many, many centuries ago. But that land is Muslim land because it was conquered by Islam. Now, I bring that up in context of Israel because Israel was conquered by the Muslims in 637-638. And the result is, it is since it was conquered by Islam, it remains Islamic forever. And so a real peace there can't be between a piece as of bygones be bygones. And there is no word in Arabic which has the word bygones be bygones. Unfortunately, in the Middle East, it's a culture of revenge, and you don't put the past this behind you. The word which may come closest to our word for peace in English is the word sulh in Arabic, which means a temporary... Um, treaty, a temporary, a temporary alliance, until I can regroup and be strong and avenge what you did to me before. So peace, bygones be bygones, does not exist. And uh, again, maybe it's a bit too far from the Iranian thing, but that is in essence the, the story here. You, whether or not um, Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech was important why it was important, and if he accomplished his objective. Sure. Okay. Um, I was at the speech, and I want to tell you, moving isn't the answer. I am a Jew, and sitting and listening to him speak, all I could think of is, and he basically mentioned this in the speech, is that in the 1930s, we didn't, there was no, army to protect the Jews. There was no place of refuge, and the Jews didn't have a voice. We were nothing. 
Netanyahu was there to tell the world that uh, that isn't the case anymore. That the Jews, that Israel will protect itself. It can and will. And if any Jews need to come there, well, we saw what happened with France and what he said there. And a voice means that Jews can speak up. They have a seat at the table. And they can and will make their case known. Now, making his case known in uh, at Congress, Congress is a co-equal branch of the American government. Um, in an odd way, I think that uh, uh, that uh, the you know, there there are a bunch of foreign leaders who who make speeches in before a joint session of conference. But the way the Obama administration and its allies handled this from the beginning um, made it one of one of the most important speeches, certainly in my lifetime, um, that that I've ever heard. Because everybody and his mother wanted to hear it, because uh, it, it's Obama and his friends who who really, you know, if it's so bad, I want to hear what it is. The speech was stellar. There were a lot of people with tears in their eyes. There were a lot of people from my own experience afterwards um, listening to um, staffers talk who were saying, why this man, they were saying, this, I'm just quoting them, that, uh, that Prime Minister Netanyahu is culturally more American and standing up for the West than the President of the United States. Um, one of them jokingly said to me afterwards, Jesus, we can only have him as our candidate for president in 2016. It it the, it was electrifying, and what he said and did was that as the prime minister um, uh, was simply remarkable. In the Middle East, Middle Easterners are constantly looking for where's the power. They're, they want to identify the bandwagon in the traffic jam. The bandwagon will be the winner, and they want to jump on and be with the winner. Whether it's been a Republican or Democratic uh, administration, nobody has wanted to um, support the Iranians in overthrowing their regime. Now, let me tell you, I lived through the early and mid-stages of the previous, the, the revolution against the Shah. I was going to a religious university in northeastern Iran, a place, a city called Mashhad. And I watched in a series of a few months where I was asking my fellow students which of the grand ayatollahs did their family support. According to, to uh, Shiism, uh, every family is to have a grand ayatollah whom they support, they give money to, they listen to for decisions. And I asked Iranians, my fellow students, I was 28 years old at the time, who is the Grand Ayatollah that you support? And they all looked at me like I was crazy. They didn't know what I was talking about. It's the equivalent of asking a Jew who was Moses, who was Abraham, and they say, I've never heard the name before. Something was askew, but I didn't know what it was. I then, after a while, I, I was puzzling because I knew that's the way Shiism was supposed to work. I began to list the names of grand ayatollahs, and I knew the names of six. Among them was Khomeini. I didn't know much about him, but I knew his name. And I mentioned these six names to people, and they didn't. They responded very politely and quietly. They had no idea, supposedly, what I was talking about. Now, as the country began to fall apart, and again, this was very quick, the, uh, the windows were broken and riots and, and, and all sorts of things went on. Some of my fellow students that I had asked these questions I mentioned before were out in the street yelling, death to the Shah, long live Khomeini. I was mad. Americans don't like when you lie to them. Clearly, the, the students were lying to me, or at least I thought. Frankly, I was wrong, but didn't know it yet. And um, I was furious. I went back to the dorms. About an hour or so later, there's a knock on my door. Harold, can we speak with you? And about six guys or so come in. They close the door behind them. 
and very quietly asked me, and they were out demonstrating, these guys, against the Shah and for Khomeini. And what do they ask me very simply? Who's Khomeini? And I'm like, what are you talking about? You were just out there demonstrating for him. Well, I, I told you I got it wrong before. Here's the answer. They didn't know who Khomeini was. They saw that power was shifting from the Shah to Khomeini. And they remembered that I had mentioned his name and therefore thought I'd know something about him. And that's why they came to me. They didn't know who he was, but they needed to be with the winner. And the winner looked like it was going to be Khomeini, and that's why they were for Khomeini. Now, if we apply this to regime change, the same is true in Iran today. Now, when Richard Armitage was the number two behind Colin Powell at the State Department, and there were Iranian elections which were skewed. It was unbelievable what the government did. I mean, they got the results that they determined they, they, they wanted. And Richard Armitage, in his message to the Iranian people was, Iran has its own type of democracy. The message that the people got from that is, America won't support us if we would revolt, so why even try? Then later, uh, after um, the second time that Ahmadinejad was reelected, whatever that means, chosen, and people were out in the streets, Obama completely ignored it. He wouldn't open his mouth and say anything. People were then killed in the streets. And that's how the Iranians saw it. What I'm telling you is that if they believed that they had American support, um, they, they, there's no doubt in my mind that they would be out in the streets. It, we all said, oh, we want to know about public opinion. In the Middle East, public opinion is subservient to power. And if America runs, things are awful. If America supports you, things are great and very quickly. Let me give you a proof of this also. There was something in 2007 in western Iraq, Sunni western Iraq, called the surge. The surge, General Petraeus, came up with a, com a campaign in the area where America – it was basically chaos, to put it mildly. Al-Qaeda was all over the place. It's a Sunni area. And the Marines came in, and they basically – they took over the place. They pushed out Al-Qaeda, and there had been 18 tribes – that opposed us, because it's all tribal identities that matter there. And three were sort of marginal. Within one year, once they saw that America was there to help, and it was, as they said it, the Marines, the Marines were the strongest tribe. People began to work with the Americans. And within one year, we then had, it was amazing, from 18 tribes against us, we had 18 tribes for us, and three were marginal but moving towards us and that's because General Petraeus and President Bush Jr. at the time displayed power they Middle Easterners the people there said we can trust we can trust them we can rely on them and the Sunnis there hated Al-Qaeda because Al-Qaeda leaders were coming in and telling the local leaders I will marry your daughter your son will marry um, who I tell and all that and these people these local people wanted to control their own lives. They didn't want Al-Qaeda telling them what to do. General Petraeus came in and worked with the local leadership, and we all of a sudden took a situation which was devastating and made it one of the most safe and secure areas in Iraq. Now, once Obama decided to flee, the same thing, they, they had to look again for power. Are they therefore pro um, um, uh, Islamic State, IS, or ISIS, or as the president insists on calling it ISIL. Um, it's all the same. They're not pro this, but they can't be with the loser, because if they are, they are dead. That's the story of, the, of how Iran would work. America is capable of doing many things to show that this regime is unable to oppress its people anymore. But America needs to have the will. And if it 
just as we did with Petraeus, we could do things without military force. And now there are all sorts of possibilities, and I don't think it's a good idea to name what they are. But technologically, we could make communication with the military inside the military in Iran very difficult. Um, we could have all sorts of things with a bit of sophistication if people knew Iranian culture. We could have people working against each other. We could have a big party. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you just one other story. Um, again, something I witnessed uh, in Iran. There was a government, excuse me, there was a, a riot where people were yelling, we don't want Shah. Now, in Persian, the language again of Iran, there is no a or the. And you know from the context of a sentence, do they mean a or the? We don't want a Shah, we don't want this particular, the Shah. Well, they're all yelling, we don't want Shah. And then all of a sudden, the secret police come in and start to beat up a few people. And the chant changes. We don't want Shah. Why should we want another? We have one. That's Iran. This can work with a, a bit of brains. And as I said before, we do not have the people who uh, understand the country. Uh, I would I would just maybe add one other thing in our, our, our abilities to understand what's going on. The when when I was somewhere around 89, 90, 91, I don't remember way back when, I was in the policy planning staff at the Pentagon. We asked the Iranian analytical section of the CIA to come and give us a briefing. Seven people come, because God forbid one person should express his own opinions. And they begin to show us slides. In the good old days, we had slides instead of um, uh, what are they? Uh, uh, in, in, instead of uh, um, uh, powerpoints. And I'm looking. I'm the only one who knows Persian in, in this briefing. And I'm looking at this, and there's something radically wrong with these slides. And I keep asking them, "What is going on?" And one was of a riot. I don't know where. I don't know what. I don't remember, and I didn't know then. And I kept pointing to the slides and what's going on, what can you tell us, and they fudged it. Finally, after five, six slides, I don't remember, I said to them, there's something radically wrong with these slides. And they look at me in silence, and only the head of this group opened his mouth and thought nobody else did. And I, and I, he, I said, he, he said, what's wrong? I said, please look at them. And now there's silence for a few moments. And, um, and he, he said, well, what's the problem? I said, they're backwards. Well, how do you know? Do you know where this place is? I said, I have no idea who, where it is, none whatsoever. Well, how do you know they're backwards? Because the signs are all backwards. Here is the analytical section was, was completely even incompetent in recognizing the script, the Persian script. And these were doing analysis back at that time for the American government. You don't have to be a big maven of, of Persian or something like that, but at least, at least, you should know something about the language and the culture. And if you can't recognize the script, we're in really serious trouble. Well, I can't answer that. Um, I can say that, by and large, Islam is taught in the West from a Sunni perspective. Shiites are called heterodox, not real. Um, it's, uh, oh, by the way, there are others. Um, and the idea that um, they, 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 they loathe each other, and uh, Sunnis at times, especially like the Wahhabis, don't even recognize the Shiites as Muslims. Um, it's, this, it's, it's so great, and it goes back 1,400 years, and um, as I mentioned before, you can't let bygones be bygones, and they're still fighting that battle. Now, when Khomeini got off the, the plane and uh, when he came back to Tehran, one of the first things he said, it may have been the first, I simply don't remember, is that I've come to rectify a wrong which took place 1,400 years ago. He didn't talk about the Shah. He didn't talk about America. He didn't talk about Israel. Well, what is that wrong? The wrong is that when their prophet Muhammad died, 
The question was who was going to rule Islam? Was it the family that eventually became called the Shiites, Muhammad's family, or the Meccan aristocracy that eventually becomes the Sunnis? To us, something which happened so long ago is irrelevant. But as I said, bygones are never bygones. There is no word for peace, no concept of peace as we know it both in the United States um, and uh, you know, among Jewish sources. It's very sad, but it's the reality. I uh, put it this way. The way that our leadership is making decisions today is beyond me. I have no tools to understand it. It's much easier for me to understand the Muslim mindset than some of the decision-making coming out of our government. It's based on wishful thinking. Let me just give you um, another story, and that is that when the Obama administration came to power, I was at a dinner with someone whose name you would recognize, but I don't think it's proper to mention who it is. Um, He was about to become an Obama official. And he was going to have a major say in what was going on in Iran. And I told him, and he knows me, I said, you know, I have written a study on how Iranians negotiate. And I'd be very happy to share it with you if you'd like. And he politely said yes, and why do you, you'll see why I say politely in a moment. So I brought it over to where he had his temporary office, and when uh, there, there was a woman who came out to get that survey um, from me, and she brought it in, put it on his desk, and it was explained – Uh, It was written on it, what it was and who it was from. And this woman, I asked her, could you do me a favor? Could you tell me what happens with it? And she calls me in about 45 minutes an hour, I don't remember exactly, and said, I walked back into the office, and the study was in the burn bag. The burn bag means where you put classified trash, unopened. Now, I'm not asking that they agree or disagree with me. But I have some experience in that country, and again, one of the few. And that wasn't their interest. They They had a particular view of what they wanted to do. They believed that by doing particular things, they could get the Iranians to do what they wanted. These were incentives that worked for Iran. They thought, excuse me, they worked for us. And they figured since every human being is the same, it would probably work for Iran. But the Iranians just laughed. Now, I want to say something else which will sound very crazy to us, but it doesn't. It it, it rings perfectly well in the Iranian mind. It's interesting what the name of our president means in Persian. O ba ma. O means he. Ba means with. Ma means us. He is with us. Well, what does this mean? While Obama was running the first time for president, the Iranian government told its people very clearly, don't even try to revolt, because if he wins, he's on our side. He is with the Iranian government. Obama, he is with us. Ma, ba, o, and we are with him. Now, he was inaugurated on January the 21st. I, what was the year? 2009. I, I don't remember exactly. And what happened was two months later was the Iranian New Year's. Iranian New Year's is the first day of spring. It's the most logical of all New Year's, uh, I think, anywhere, because it means rebirth. And um, it's called Nowruz, New Day, was what it means in Persian. And during the previous years of the Islam, since the Islamic Revol- uh, Revolution, the American government, the, the president, a lot of leaders, send greetings to the Iranian people on the anniversary, their, on their New Year's. But Obama did it differently. 
Obama did send greetings to the people, and then he said, and, and also to the, is the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, no one had ever said that before, and that indicated to the people that what the Iranian government was telling them before, that Obama is with us, from their point of view, that greeting proved to the Iranian people that Obama was with the Iranian government. And again, in a, it was a group of people who are looking for signs of weakness. They just saw that the Iranian government was strong. Now, one can make an excellent argument that from the advent of the first Obama administration that the goal was to come to an agreement with the regime in Iran. Now, Michael Duran has written a marvelous piece in a magazine called Mosaic in which he traces the history of Obama's relationship with Iran from, from even before he became president. And it, it's a stellar piece. It's very, very worth reading. And it, it, it shows, basically, that this was Obama's goal from, from, from the start, from the get-go. So where our people are, I mean, they weren't really interested in trying to understand Iran. And I guarantee you, if you would read my study, I, again, it's published just on the net. It was eventually published by Dory Gold, JCPA. Dot org. It's on there. It's called Iran- Iranian Negotiating Behavior, and it's, it's all it is is stories, stories that I lived through in Iran, fun stories, but they give you an insight into the Iranian mindset. These are things that, unfortunately, the uh, leadership was not interested in, and the American leadership was not interested in because it doesn't fit their narrative, and the Iranians are playing us for a song. Uh, could you, I'm sorry to ask, but you could that cite to the history of Obama's relationship with Iran. I'm sorry, what was that site again? Um, Mosaic Magazine. I think it's mosaic.com. And the author is Michael Doran, D for David, O, R for Rachel, A, N for Nancy, is the author. Okay. Well, I have a few answers. Um, he's had cancer for a long time. He's been in and out of the hospital. I have no idea why they're publicizing this now. Um, I, I'm sure if they are publicizing it, it has probably has something to do with the negotiations, but it's beyond me to know. Um, uh, to just take another uh, a point that you, you mentioned, uh, um the people ruling Iran now, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who founded the Iranian Revolution, he looked at the people ruling Iran now as extremists, dangerous, because their view of Shiite Islam, the ones who are ruling right now, believe that if they provoke a conflagration with the outside world, are in the process of losing they can make their Messiah, which they call Mahdi, they can make their Messiah come. He will come back. He's disappeared about 1,200 years ago. I think it's 872 or 873. And he'll come back and he'll save them. And there are interesting arguments of, that they make. Is Muhammad going to be on one side? Is Ali, who is his son-in-law, and really the center of Shiite Islam, is he on the other? And arguments of who's going to stand where. But a conflagration is an incentive, an inducement. So a nuclear bomb, if there's no mad mutual assured destruction, which we in the West assume that the Soviets would keep them in place, they don't want to be destroyed, and therefore they wouldn't try to destroy us. Whatever the case is, in Iran it's the opposite. Nuclear weapons make, give you an, out an incentive. You can bring on their Mahdi, their Messiah, to come and support them as they're losing because if they would use a bomb, maybe Iran would be attacked with the bomb. And so they want to bring it on. And uh, uh, Khomeini is part of this. And Rouhani is just a, a nice face of all of this. If you look at the history of Rouhani, the, the president, and some of the awful things that he has said and done over the years, 
And, of course, America, we have this phrase, oh, that's history. What happened yesterday doesn't matter. But in the Middle East, as I said before, bygones aren't bygones. And so, what you know, this is just the nice face, the, the good cop. I mean, the John was the bad cop. So um, uh, it's just one more reason we must do everything we can to make sure that Iran cannot be a breakout nuclear power. I think that's the right term in English. I'm not sure where that it will have the ability to develop a bomb, which is where the agreement, what has already been made public, is um, right now that eventually Iran will be able to make a nuclear bomb after the sanctions, after the 10-year, whatever period of time, I don't know, that is in this agreement. Uh, so uh, just to, again, to go back to Khamenei, um, uh, he's had cancer before. He's had cancer for a long time. He was near death about two years ago. Now he, you know, he's going to live for another two years. Whatever the case is, um, uh, it, it becomes irrelevant. Please understand everything that the Iranians are doing. They have a strategy, and that is to get the nuclear bomb. And you say it's not really only against Israel. Israel is nothing more than a pawn as far as he is concerned. What he, what the, what the Shiites want to do, and Khomeini said it when he got off in the tarmac, as I said before. Shiism is the correct form of Islam, and they see Israel as um, uh, they don't care about Israel. Believe me, they're not anti-Israel. They're not pro-Israel, but they want. All of the Sunni Arab powers have not been able to defeat Israel. And they are saying, we are the way, we, are the, we got it right. And they are, the Iranian government is appealing over the heads of the Arab Sunni leadership right to the people. Again, the goal is to make the whole Muslim world Shiite. Again, this may be irrelevant to us, but it's not to them. Now, Israel, therefore, will show you how to defeat Israel. And imagine they had a bomb. Again, you are solving the problem that the weak Arab Sunni leaders were unable to solve. And that's, what, that's the position of Israel. Again, there are all these incentives to try to destroy Israel. But, um, uh, uh, but their real goal, Israel's nothing more, as I said, a pawn. The real goal is to destroy the Arab Sunni regimes. And that's why the Saudis and all the, the Gulf regimes and Jordan um, look at um, the Iranians and their they have potential to get a nuclear bomb as an existential threat. Saudis are defenseless. They know they cannot rely on the United States. We have proven our unreliability by abandoning them and trying to beg the Iranians to give us an agreement, to make an agreement with us. And so we can't be trusted. And we abandoned the Shah back in 1978 and 79. And the Saudis are saying to themselves, wait a minute. If they're going to abandon such a close ally, which the Shah was of the United States, will they abandon us too? America, unfortunately, to quote the, the, the uh, Professor Bernard Lewis, who, God willing, will be at the end of May, 99 years old, um, he said that America proves itself – a, um, a harmless enemy and an unreliable friend. He says it in reverse order, that America it proves over and over again that it's an unreliable friend and a harmless enemy. And that scares all of these impotent regimes, and that's what they are in the Middle East. First of all, people in jail, mention their names. Explain the Iranian government for what it is. Cruel, horrible people. There have been more people killed in Iran per year, executed by the regime uh, for political crimes, basically, than anywhere. Number one, say that. Number two, bring leaders, even the, the young Shah, for, for better or for worse, have them come for meals at the White House. In the Middle East, the idea of a the idea that you're having a meeting there is more important than what you say at the meeting. 
people will see that we uh, we're serious. Now we can also get there are many many things. Again, I'm hesitant to talk about what they are. We are technologically unbelievably capable, and we can in various ways help people inside Iran who um, oppose the regime. And uh, with 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 all sorts, of, there are many many ways. I just it's not right to say these things in public. But it requires a decision, a decision from on top, not only from the, the, Amer- the top of the American government. And then it requires people who know Iran. And as I mentioned before, we don't have those people. I can tell you that I myself have absolutely zero desire to be back in government. Um, but I could identify for you people who are outside the government, some of whom probably would have difficulty getting security clearances. Our system destroys ourselves. And they could put together a very interesting plan, which could show the Iranian people that the Iranian regime is incapable of doing what it is necessary to keep itself in power. And that is what I lived through before, and historically in Iran, that's the way it happens. When the regime is either unwilling or incapable of, to do what it needs to do to keep itself in power, Things change very quickly. And I go back to this statement that I said about this riot. We don't want Shaw. Why don't we want Shaw? Because we have one already. They are capable of, of, and why don't we want another? Because um, we have one already. They are capable of changing their opinion on a dime because the opinion is secondary to their personal security and their family's security. This is doable. The question is, do we want to? Okay, thank. I would like to say, um, first of all, thank you very much for everyone um, for joining the call. I cannot think of a more appropriate speaker for this time, for such a time as this, as it says in, in Megillat Esther, the book of Esther that we read on Purim. Um, we are all here praying for a Purim miracle. I did read that Khamenei is in critical condition, but of course we don't know, you know, if the other Ayatollahs will be equally as bad. So it's, um, but we are praying for a a foreign... It's the regime, Sarah. It's it's the regime. regime. Right. And it depends, put it this way. The question more important on who would come next is, are, is, are there people who are willing to get along with the outside world who want to get along? I don't care if it's ruled by Ayatollahs. What I care about is they want to get along with the world, and they stop being the center of terrorism in the world. It's mm-hmm. not our decision who rules Iran. Right. What we care about is they don't make trouble. Right, right. Anyway, so we, we are also praying for a poor miracle, and the miracle that we're praying for right now is that as I told you earlier today, Harold, that um, our leaders recognize the virtuous Mordechai um, or the distinction between the virtuous Mordechai and the evil Haman, and that our world leaders, for once, side with the virtuous Mordechai. 